Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the Gospel of John chapter 15, beginning in verse one, and we'll get there in just one second. We are in a series called Proximity, and we're looking at the seven statements or words of Jesus where Jesus says, I am. He says this seven times in the Gospel of John. And every single time Jesus says the words, I am, Jesus in no uncertain terms is telling his disciples, telling us and telling the world that he is in fact God. People often ask me the difference between Christianity and other religions or other faiths all across the world. And the simple answer is Jesus. Jesus is the difference. Jesus is not like a God who is among us. Jesus is in fact God who is with us. Another word or another name for Jesus we find in scripture is Emmanuel. It means God with us. God has come near to us. God has come near to you. And we have to ask the question, well, why does that matter? What's the significance of this? And I would say, just look at our world today, the world we're living in, a world that is defined now by pandemic and crisis and anxiety and loneliness and depression. You know, people have been asking me in the last few weeks, what what's going on in my mind or how am I processing this or what's going on? And the closest metaphor or analogy I can think of are the few times when I was in high school and I would come home after school and I would kind of just lay on the couch for a moment and I'd fall asleep. And I'd wake up three hours later and it would be seven o'clock or 6.30 in the morning. Now I would think it was the next morning. I thought I had slept all night, but it was still the same day. So though I thought it was the next, the next morning, I'd wake up and I'm getting ready for school and I'm going in the kitchen, I'm making breakfast. And I remember several times my mom would come up to me and say, Nino, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm getting ready for school, mom. It's like, it's still Wednesday. Wait, it's, it's, still, it's still the same day? It's still the same day. And I would go through this kind of disoriented feeling. I'm kind of confused. Uh, I'm alive, I'm safe, but I'm confused. I don't know if you've ever had that moment before. And that's kind of what it feels like today. It feels a little bit disoriented or disorienting. It feels disappointed. It feels depressed. And in the midst of all of this, God is saying, I'm near, I'm close. I have brought my proximity to you. And so we've been challenging ourselves in this series and asking this question or making the statement, I should say, while we are in a season where we are practicing social distancing, we have this incredible opportunity to actually pursue spiritual proximity. While we are practicing social distancing, we have this incredible opportunity to actually pursue spiritual proximity with Christ. So turn with me to the gospel of John chapter 15, beginning in verse one, and let's read this together. This is the words of Jesus speaking to his disciples and Jesus speaking to us. Begins here in verse one. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Verse seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be 
full. The title of my message today is The Power of Proximity. The Power of Proximity. If we are honest with ourselves, and I'm not pretending that we are, but if we are honest with ourselves, most of us, if not all of us, are in a fight for power or control. And when we feel power slipping away or control slipping away, we do whatever we can to grab hold of control tighter and we pull it towards us. Because we think that as long as we have power, as long as we can control our situation, we can be happy. We can be satisfied. We can feel protected, we can feel secure. And so we cling and we fight and we claw for control in virtually every area of our lives. We fight to control our situations. But listen to me today, real power, real power is not the ability to control your situation. Real power rather is when your situation can't control you. Real power is that when no matter what happens to you, no matter what your circumstance or your situation, no matter what comes towards you, it cannot affect your mind or your will or your emotions or your thoughts or your behavior or your action. See, we often think that real power is our ability to produce or to achieve, achieve control, achieve success. But what the scriptures teaches us and what Jesus is saying to us in this moment is that real power is the result of a promise that you receive. Real power is the result of a promise you receive. And what is this power that you receive? It's joy pure, unadulterated, non-manufactured, non-produced joy. Go back to verse 11. Jesus says this in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my, what? My joy, say it with me, say joy, that my joy may be in you and that your, what? Your joy may be full. Listen, I know we're online and we're digital today, but I need you to go ahead and say amen, put it in the chat. Just that's how we're going to talk back to each other today. He says, joy, that is what we have the fullness of. So what the scriptures teach us and what I want to talk about today is the power of proximity because the power of proximity is the eternal presence of joy. The power of proximity is the eternal presence of joy. In other words, the closer that you and I get towards Jesus, the more of his joy we actually experience. See, in in the center of the universe is a profound and beautiful and dynamic relationship between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And there is a love and a joy that exists inside of them. And the closer that you and I get towards Jesus, the more that we pursue Jesus, the more of that joy we experience. Jesus, Colossians says, is at the center of the universe. Colossians says that the entire universe, the world, everything in the world was made through him, for him, and by him. He is at the center. The entire universe revolves around the Lord Jesus. And the closer that we move towards Jesus, and I'm not pretending that it's always easy. In fact, I was speaking with a friend the other day and I asked him the question, do you love Jesus? And I thought he gave what I what I believe is the most profound and honest answer. He said, I'm trying, I'm trying. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that profound? As we move and we try to love Jesus and we pursue him, the more of his joy we actually experience. This is the power that we receive. The word joy that Jesus uses in verse 11 in the Greek is the word kara. It means gladness or delight, to delight in God to the point where we are 
full, not just a delight that is just a little bit of delight or just sort of on the fringes of delight, but we are full and overwhelmed. That means we are satisfied by Christ. We are satisfied in his presence. You know, every time I read the word joy in scripture, I don't know why this happens, but my mind instantly goes to the movie Sister Act, not part one, but part two where Sister Mary Clarence is the choir director at this you know, private Catholic high school and she's gonna direct the choir. And of course, if you watch that movie, Lauren Hill before the Fugees, she stars in it and gets to the very last kind of scene and dance and they're performing in this choir show and they sing the song, joyful, joyful, Lord, we adore thee. And I've watched that hundreds of times. I watched it back when it was on tape. You actually had to go buy a, buy a tape and you had to you know, be kind and rewind when you took it back to the store. But I memorized that song. I memorized the dance moves, every part of it, even, even the rap part, you know, the joyful, joyful Lord, we adore. I could do the whole thing if you want. I, I could do the whole thing right now. Wait, let, let's go, I do the whole thing. But I love that movie because there's an expression that I just find in that movie when they sing that song, there's this delight and this joy inside of them. And to a far greater degree, God is saying that the more that we pursue his son, the more that we pursue Jesus, the more of his gladness and delight we experience. So the question we have before us today in our time together is how do we pursue proximity to experience the power of joy? I want you to do something with me just for, a, just for a few moments, just indulge me a little bit. I want you to take out your hands and make a fist as tight as you possibly can. I mean, just clinch them as hard as you can. Keep going. Now, what I feel is discomfort. What I feel is pain. What I don't feel is joy. And see, most of us go through life like this. Most of us go through faith like this. A lot of us even go through our marriages and our parenting, our money, our ambitions, and we try to hold on to all of it. And we try and we try and we try to squeeze any amount of joy out of it. But let me ask you, the tighter you're doing this, are you actually experiencing any joy in this moment? The more that you are holding on like this? Are you experiencing more joy? And what God is saying to you today, and what I wanna free you from today is that joy is not something you produce. Power is not something you achieve this way, but God is saying, if, if it's joy that you want, and I believe it is, I know I want joy, then God is saying to receive it, you actually have to open your hands. Now open your hands. And you can feel instantly the release. You can feel the pain moving away. And this is what God is saying. So where do we begin? We begin by opening our hands, opening our hearts, opening our minds, opening our lives. And it starts in verse one, where Jesus says the words, I am. In verse one, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father, is the vine dresser. Now what Jesus is doing in this moment is, is he's using a metaphor that has deep historical and theological significance. When Jesus says the word vine to us, it seems distant because we don't live in an agrarian culture. But for the audience in Jesus's day, they would have understood that vine was actually a powerful symbol. It would have been familiar to the disciples. It really illustrated God's care for his people. See, the idea of a vine and God caring for his people begins in the ancient story of God and his people, which we find in the Old Testament of the Bible. In the Old Testament, in this ancient story, we see that God has chosen for himself and created for himself a people, the Jewish people. And he created a nation, the nation of Israel. And he gives Israel this land, what is known as the promised land. And he says to his people, you will be my people and I will be your God. And it was the role of Israel to reflect to the world, to represent to the world, God's love, God's truth, and God's grace. 
And God says, as you obey me, because I will be your God and you will be my people, as you obey me, I will increase blessing and I will increase joy in your life. The only problem is Israel disobeys. His people disobey. They reject God. They hold on and they fight for control. They want to be like the rest of the world. They fall into idolatry. And in the end, what they don't find is joy. In the end, what they receive is actually oppression and captivity. So when Jesus says the words in verse one, I am the true vine, Jesus is telling his disciples and he's telling us, he's telling the church that he is in fact the new heavenly vineyard. He is the new promise of God. Jesus is saying that he is in fact the true Israel sent from God the Father into the human story, into human existence to reflect to the world God's love, God's truth and God's grace. And through his life, his death, his burial and his resurrection, Jesus reflects just that. God's truth, God's grace and God's love. And through all of this, because he is the true vine, he invites us into what that means, the reality of life in the gospel, the reality of his proximity. And Jesus says, you can now take hold of me. I am the new promise. I am the eternal promise. So to take hold of Jesus in this moment as the true vine is not just to say, okay, I I believe in you, or there's a feeling that you evoke somehow, but it's to actually surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's to say, Jesus, I confess that you are in fact Lord and Savior. You are in fact King of of the universe. You are God. I confess that I am a sinner in need of your grace. I repent. And then I receive the assurance of your love and your grace and your truth. And you have filled me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this important specifically in John 15? What Jesus is doing and why this is important is that Jesus is describing life as a follower of him. He is showing us how one must live if they are a follower of Jesus. He's showing us how someone who has surrendered to him lives. Notice the words that happen multiple times. Notice that these words in me appear several times. It says, you are a branch in me. You abide in me. This reflects the teaching found throughout the New Testament that those who have put their hope and their trust and faith in Christ are in fact in Christ. 75 times, over 75 times in the New Testament, you'll see the words in Christ. What in Christ describes is how God sees and treats you and I because of our relationship with Jesus. This is what is known as a theological concept called positional truth. And here's why this is important. Let me, let me unpack this for you. Positional truth is this. You and I, apart from Christ, our position, our identity is that of sinners who are far from God. We are in death. We are separated from God, both here now and in eternity. But the moment you have surrendered your life to Christ, you are then in fact in Christ, which means when God sees you, when he sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees and he treats you as he treats his perfect son. Now, why is this important? Let me set some people free. I I believe God wants to set some of you free. See, some of you believe that you have to constantly perform for God or produce for God. And so when you think about how God sees you, most of us believe that God is often disappointed in us, don't we? Oh, there he is again, making that same mistake over and over again. Oh, there she is again, making the, doing the same thing over and over again, constantly failing, constantly finding herself in the same situation. And yet, do you realize that if you are in Christ, if you have put your hope and your trust and your faith in Christ, even when you are in the midst of, of the worst possible thing. God is not disappointed in you. God is not frustrated with you. God does not regret making you. He does not regret loving you. God looks at you and he says, 
I see my son, Jesus. He looks at you and says, you are holy and blameless and righteous and spotless because he sees Jesus. So I want you to remember when you are feeling tempted, when you hear the lies of the enemy, when you are being pulled into fear, remember that you are in Christ. You are in him. He is for you. He is with you. You are secure in his presence. I love the words of the old hymn. The words in the old hymn before the throne and the words say, my name is graven on his heart. My name is written on his hands. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Nothing can pull you away when you are in Christ. So Jesus says, if you are to live, abide in me. Now, why is this important? because Jesus is showing us how we should live. Now there's an important thing happening here. In scripture, you'll often find what is known as the indicative and the imperative. The indicative is that which is true. Whether or not you and I believe something, it's true. The imperative then is in light of what is true, how should we respond or how should we obey? Jesus has both here. He has the indicative. He says something that is true, And then he has an imperative, how we are then to respond or obey or live. Look at the indicative. The indicatives, they're they're full in these 11 verses. The, The first one is this. Jesus is saying, he is the vine and we are the branches. We attach to him, not the other way around. He is the vine, we are the branches. We see some other things that are true that Jesus says here that apart from him, we can do nothing. Now, what Jesus is is saying there is not that we can't do anything of any significance, but we can do nothing of eternal significance within the will of the Father. Jesus says that in him, we bear fruit. Jesus says that if we are bearing fruit, the Father who is gentle and kind will prune us in order that we might bear more fruit. Now, some of you are in this season where God is pruning some things out of your life. And let me just tell you that when God prunes, it is actually gentle and kind because God wants us to bear more fruit. Here's another indicative. Whatever we ask, it'll be done. And then here's another indicative. Those who do not abide in Jesus will wither, the branches will wither, and they'll be thrown into the fire and burned. What is Jesus specifically saying? Jesus in this text is speaking to those who are believers, those who find themselves in him. And Jesus is saying, apart from him, apart from finding ourselves in him, apart from surrendering to him, we will in fact be separated from God, both here and now and in eternity. So if Jesus is divine and we are the branches, that's true. What then is the imperative? What are we now to do? Because Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, how are we to live? How are we to discover this joy? Is it by producing? No, he never, he never, Jesus never says, now that I'm the vine, you're the branches. Now go out and make things happen. He never says this. The imperative is one word, abide. Abide, that word means to remain or to stay. In fact, in 11 verses, we see the word abide happen 10 times. Listen, it is not your responsibility, church, to produce anything in God or for God. Rather, it is your requirement to remain and to stay in him. See, the power of proximity, that that joy that we desire is dependent on, on your willingness to remain close to Jesus. As I said before, the the more that we move towards Jesus, the more he actually produces in and through you. He bears fruit. We bear the fruit that he produces. Fruit in this context is the evidence of God's work in and through you. It is the work of God's righteousness moving in and through you. In the book of Galatians, we see what is known as the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Those are not things that we produce and we manufacture, but rather as we move closer to the heart of Jesus and remain in Jesus, these are produced inside of us. I love the words of Peter Scazzaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. He says this, our activity for God can only properly flow from a life with God. We cannot give God, we cannot give what we do not possess. Doing for God in a way that is proportionate to our being with God is the only pathway to a pure heart and seeing God. So our remaining moments together, I want us to talk about this idea. If Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and joy is promised, how do we actually, how do we actually practically experience that? Because that's what we want to know. How do we actually practically pursue God and experience the power of proximity and the power of joy in our life? Jesus actually unpacks this for us. Look at verse seven, Jesus says this, this is how we practically abide in him and experience the power of proximity. In verse seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, if my words abide in you. What Jesus is saying in this moment is that we must be people of his word. God's word, God's word. This is not just some book. God's word has been breathed out by God. Scripture tells us that the words of scripture, the words of the Bible are profitable for teaching, for correction, for training. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It equips us to follow Jesus and live the life that God has called us to live. Scripture gives us the mind of God. We must be a people of the word, which must, be, which must mean that we must be a people who are shaped by God's word. We must be a people who read it, who listen to it, who talk about it, who memorize it. We must be a people who are disciplined in God's word. If you are to abide in Christ, you must practice being in God's word. It must be a daily and spiritual discipline. Listen, Sundays online or when we finally get to gather in person is not enough for you to be shaped by God's word. You must be in it. It must consume you. It must be inside of you. Because Jesus goes on to say, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, the rest of verse seven, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Which means the word of God informs the way in which we communicate or commune with God. It's both word and it's prayer. That's why Jesus says, whatever you ask, we ask in prayer. In our worship, we ask. Our prayer shapes us. You know, a lot of people will quote Psalm 37.4 and Psalm 37.4 simply says this. If you delight yourself in the Lord, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. And most people, even myself included, I remember I used to think, oh, that means whatever I ask God, as long as I you know, desire God or I delight in him, he'll give me whatever I want. And so I'm like, oh, God, let this happen for me or let this happen for me. I remember in college, I'd pray things like, Lord, let, please, please God, let her break up with him. Let her. And I, I just don't know if that was in God's will. I don't know if that was God's desire for those things to happen. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying, that when you abide in him or you ask whatever you want, God will shift his will to meet yours. Rather, the more that we are in God's word, the more that we are informed by remaining in the presence of Jesus, our will is actually shaped and aligned into God's will. So when we ask for whatever we ask, we know that we can trust it because we know that it is from God. This is how we abide in his word. And the result of living like this, we see in verse eight, is the glory of God. How else do we practically abide in Christ? How do we abide in his presence? Verse nine, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. God describes his love as an enduring love, a sacrificial love, an unconditional love. And then he says, abide in my 
love. Jesus is saying to you and I today, abide in my love. If joy is what you want, abide in my love. How do we abide in his love? Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept the father's commandment and abide in his love. See, the power of proximity is experienced. Joy is experienced when you and I actually live in obedience towards Christ and his word. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Not if you're afraid of me, not if you're scared of me, not if you're afraid of what might happen to you. If you love me, you will obey me. If you've been a part of LifeGate for a while now, you've heard me say this a million times, every command in scripture, every command in scripture is designed by God, not to limit your fun, but to increase your joy. Listen to me today. God wants to increase your joy. He wants to make it explosive and enduring in your life. And in order for you to experience the joy of Christ, we must be a people. You must be a person who obeys because you love him. So obey him, let joy be increased, abide and experience the power of proximity. Because when you live in obedience, you experience joy, the joy that comes from the assurance that you are loved by God. How many of you know right here, right now, not just intellectually, but that God loves you. He loves you. You have the assurance of his forgiveness, which brings joy. You have the assurance that God can be trusted, which brings joy. So many of us right now, we, we're struggling with joy because we simply can't trust God. It's difficult for us to trust God. And God is saying, bring that towards me. And he wants to show us how trustworthy he is, that joy might be increased in our lives. This is the power of proximity. But here's the tension that I find myself in if I'm honest with myself. You know, I'm no different than most everyone watching right now. I have my moments where everything is great and I feel the joy of God and I, and I feel his presence. And then the very next moment, I feel overwhelmed. I feel overwhelmed by fear. I, fear, I hear the lies of the enemy and I can get pulled into it too. And so the tension is how do I how do I remain? How do we remain in this joy? Because joy is what we want. I think it's the cry of every human soul to experience an enduring and eternal joy. And if you're anything like me, you're asking the question, why don't I feel joy? Why don't you feel joy? As I was thinking about this message and preparing it for all of us at LifeGate, I really thought about what would I title this? And I came up with the title, the the power of proximity. But if I had another title, I think I would have called it the power of the unexpected. The power of the unexpected. See, one one of the profound realities of when something unexpected happens to you is that it actually exposes some things in your life. Whenever something unexpected occurs, the result is that it exposes something in your life. And I think what this situation that we've been in now for, this, for the past several weeks, four, five, six, seven weeks that we've been in this crisis, this pandemic, this lockdown, this social distancing is exposed some things about us. It's exposed the loneliness inside of us. It's exposed the anxiety inside of us. It's exposed the idols we've built our life on is it's, it's, it's exposed the things that we have actually been abiding in. We've been abiding in money, in our 401k, in the economy, in our relationships, in our friendships, in our jobs, in our situations. It's exposed how weak our plans actually are. See, everybody has a plan. But in the words of the immortal Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan till you get punched in the face. And when the unexpected happens, it exposes some things. 
See, why does Jesus say this? Of all the I am statements, this is in fact the last one that Jesus brings up. Why here? Why now? Jesus says, I am the vine in the midst of what is known as his farewell discourse. His very last sort of speech and teaching to his disciples. There they are sitting in just a few moments. Jesus will be betrayed. He'll be crucified and hung on a cross. But here he is with his disciples. And Jesus knows that in an instant, in just a few short moments, their entire world is about to be turned upside down. They are about to experience the unexpected and it will expose some things about them. It will expose some fears. It will expose some doubts. It will expose some realities in their life that they are not prepared for. And Jesus in fact says, these things will come to you. Trouble will come to you, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And when Jesus says to you and I, listen, life is not promised where everything is going to go your way. There will be some times and some seasons that are unexpected where it won't go your way. There might be some suffering and some pain and loss that doesn't go your way. And in those moments, it is important that you abide in him. And what this season has shown us and shown me are the things that we have been abiding in. And if you are not experiencing joy in your life, The question has to be, what have I been abiding in? What have I been trying to remain and stay in? Because it's not bringing me joy. And this season has exposed that. So Jesus, knowing that his disciples' world is about to get turned upside down, says to them, I am the vine. Abide in me. Live in me. Remain in me. Stay in me in me and experience a joy that is eternal, a joy that existed before time began, a joy that is not predicated on circumstance, a joy that is not predicated on situations, a joy that says no matter what you face, no matter what happens, you can endure by the power of Christ and the power of joy that is inside of you. That is the power of God's proximity. That is the power of Jesus. Now tell me, is that not the joy that you want? because it's the joy you were designed for. This is what Jesus offers you, a joy that is both available and attainable, not by fighting and clawing and trying to control, but by releasing and receiving his word, receiving his power, receiving his love and receiving his joy. So in this season, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're in, I know it's real and I know it's hard, but I want to encourage you to pursue the proximity of Jesus. The same Jesus who says, come to me, come to me, lay your burdens before me for my way is not like your way. Receive the joy I have for you. And my prayer for you in this season remaining is that you would take an op- the opportunity, you would take advantage of the time that you have now And you would pursue him. You would abide in Christ. You would abide in his word. You would abide in prayer. You would abide in worship. You would abide in his love. And you would abide with your life and experience the joy of the Lord like never before. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that right here, right now, that anyone who is not experiencing the joy of Christ right here, right now, would experience your joy. It would come fresh. It would come anew. God, call us to abide in your word, call us to abide in your presence, to abide through prayer, through abide in our lives, abide in worship, to fill our lives, to be in your presence. Remind us to abide in your love, your love that is eternal, your love that is enduring, your love that is secure. And Lord, I pray for anyone who is watching and listening right now, who is in the fight for their lives for joy. Lord, I pray that you would cause them to release power and control and struggle and receive from you the joy that you promised, the joy that satisfies, that is full. So fill us now with your joy. Fill us with the power of your proximity. We love you. And together, all of God's people said, amen. As we continue in our time of worship, 
one of the things that we love to do as a church. You know, if you're here with us, we gather, we do this every single Sunday. We participate and we partake in communion together. Communion is a beautiful expression of abiding in the power of Christ. And so I want you right here, right now, just to go ahead and, and get the elements you have prepared. We're going to be doing this every Sunday from here on out. So get, get the elements and get them ready. And then take a few moments and confess and repent towards the Lord and ask that he would renew and restore the joy in your heart and your soul. If there's a place in your life where you are not experiencing joy, pray that God would fill that place, that you would release and receive his joy. See, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples. He lifted up the bread and he said, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for you. Every time you eat of this, remember me. And then he lifted up the cup, which held the wine, which represented the blood of the new covenant. And Jesus said, every time you drink, remember that my blood was shed for you and poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. So as the worship team sings this song, I want to just encourage you to find a moment of prayer to confess and to repent. And whenever you're ready, you would partake together with anyone who's with you or with all of us together. And though we're separate in different homes, we're believing right now in the power of unity and the power of the presence of Jesus. We do all this to exalt Jesus together. And my prayer is that you would feel his presence and know his joy like never before.